Welcome back to the booth. I'm Brian Jepson, senior editor with O'Reilly Media, and I'm here with Colin Miller of Microsoft and Chris Walker of Secret Labs. Now, you guys are part of a great global conspiracy to <laughs> shrink embedded hardware, to open source it, and when um, we first joined this story, where we left off, there were these spot watches that people were wearing. They were connected to a wireless network, a smart personal object technology. Uh, Microsoft, had, it was a platform for people to do messaging and information gathering on their wrists. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like it was full of promise. I met people who said, if I could only just hack inside of these things. <laughs> and, and then somehow those watches went away. They sort of dropped off the market. And then the next thing I know, you know, I, I start seeing you around and you around, and there's these little things where you took where you took the the smartwatch and you turned it inside out, and now all the technology that was in the smartwatches is a open source electronic prototyping system uh, based on .NET, and everything's open source. The hardware, the the this is the Netduino we're looking at. What happened? How did we get here, right? I mean, who did you both work with smart with these smart watches? Uh, actually, I, I started with smart watches uh, fairly early on in the project, and uh, part of my responsibility was getting .NET onto those watches so that we could Hire so them. that we could uh, actually do the programming for the applications. Um, we at wanted to open up those watches, but they actually went away a little too fast okay. for us. Uh, but what happened was we actually ended up using that platform for a lot of other things internally. So we decided there was enough interest in that that we uh, brought it out uh, in a more broad uh, open source, eventually open source. We, uh, we made a couple of, of uh, tries at uh, making money on it, but there wasn't much opportunity for that. Uh, but still, it had a lot of value. So we, we, uh, we, we started an open source uh, version of the micro framework. We do it, it's out under Apache 2. Now the micro framework is, is based on .NET, right. which is Microsoft's platform for software development, for applications, right. for all sorts of things. You use languages like C-sharp, visualbasic.net, right. and, or is it just Visual Basic now? No, um, C-sharp, both. Yeah. Okay, but, but I mean, is, the, is it called yeah. Visual Basic? They, or Visual oh, yeah. Basic? yeah. They dropped the .net, and it, um, it's a managed runtime. You've got all sorts of threads and great stuff, and then, then what happened with the with these spot watches, it got shrunk down for the embedded system, right. and now you've open sourced that part, which includes compilers, runtime, tools, um, and, and now you can use that for doing embedded development, but it's still like, it's a lot like desktop programming. It's a, almost exactly like desktop programming. You do it all in Visual Studio, you create your applications, you deploy from inside Visual Studio, and then you debug the code that's running on those very small devices inside Visual Studio. So if you're a .NET developer, it's easy as can be. And if you're not a .NET developer yet, it's a great uh, way to get more productive. Now, now, how did this guy get into the picture? I mean, what, what is, he started building these .NET micro framework boards, Netduino, um, and the, we, they're, Pretty cheap. They're thirty-five dollars for the basic one, and what sixty dollars for the one with Ethernet. Right, yeah. um, and so, Chris, how did you get? Did, were you a spot watch guy? You know, I actually owned a spot watch. I owned two or three or four, and and by the end, I think Colin gave me one, so I might have had five. Um, gave them as gifts, loved them, and in fact, wanted to write code for them myself. And there was no public SDK. It was a very closed ecosystem, and that made me sad because as a um, as a person with years of C# -sharp programming or .NET programming experience, I really wanted to get in there and, and build stuff myself. But uh, past that, we started building at work a number of electronic devices. Once the micro framework came out, it actually wasn't originally open source. And we were working with companies who were making modules and boards, and we wanted to build stuff with it, but transitioning from software to hardware was really fairly difficult. And when the micro framework went open source, I said, gosh, let's take everything we've learned about how as software people to make hardware, turn it into an open source hardware platform to go with the open source software .NET micro framework runtime, and then put it out there in the world and make it compatible with a lot of existing open source hardware that's out there and as well. And that's about where I met you. Yep. And you were about to launch this product, mm -hmm. and like you said, compatible with a lot of hardware that hobbyists use already um, and you've got 
and 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 you ended up launching it with the with the base the thirty five dollar model, and then eventually came out with the with the with the plus. Yep, and um, the little tiny mini. And the tiny mini, and so how has that how has that grown uh, i mean where where are we now i mean you've we, got people who are programming yeah no we, we, it? we, we literally have tens of thousands of software developers who are building embedded electronics either for fun or for profit um, based off of the open source hardware we've seen the first commercial products in less than a year go from picking up a netuino uh, building a prototype and then actually shipping a commercial product derived from those designs, maybe even switching to a different brand of microcontroller manufacturer because MicroFramework is open source not just for Atmel chips but for NXP chips and other manufacturers as well. And that's all happened in less than a year. Plus, we've seen a huge community of hobbyists, educators, and people who are professional developers but are looking for a little downtime on the side, mm -hmm. you know, building products and kits. So, so, so speaking of, of that little bit of downtime on the side, mm -hmm. you know, if we're going to, you're having some fun, um, let's start with Colin. What, what sort of, what are like the top two or three cool projects you've seen people make either with Netduino or with the micro framework? I'm always amazed by the, actually the even commercial applications that uh, that uh, come out with this. Uh, we were talking. We actually had a, a talk earlier where I brought up uh, somebody was prototyping actually managing the garbage collection in the city of Venice using the, the garbage the, collection in the city of Venice. Yeah, which okay. apparently is quite complicated given that they're mostly wa mostly waterways. Uh, other things were, were somebody who created a uh, instrumentation for a school where all the kids are managed by RFID badges that they have okay. to swipe around. That's in the Netherlands. I don't know if they'd get away with that. They here. wouldn't get away with that here, and I'm already creeped out. But it's okay. It's okay because it's the Netherlands. Anything goes. All yeah. right. So lots of cool things. I'm sure you've heard of some. Yeah. Yep. Well, actually, he. I've seen a lot. So there was. There, tell him about the uh, the little game console. Oh right. Oh yeah. This so is breaking news. This yeah. Is so open source. Fabian Royer is a fantastic member of the community, and Netduino. As much as it's about open source, it's really about the community and what people are building. It's about empowering people to make really cool stuff. Uh, Fabian Royer created a open source handheld portable gaming console. It is, you know, take an Xbox or a Sony PlayStation and make it way less sophisticated. Uh, but you can put SD cards in and there's a game inspired by, Ant by um, what was the one with the boulders? Asteroids. 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 Um, Geometry Wars type games. But he has a oh, whole wow. suite of these games and he's putting together not only a prototype board but PCBs and it's all open sourced and writing some books, uh, materials around how to build this and do it yourself. But it was on Adafruit's Ask an Engineer last week. Um, the videos are up on YouTube and it's just another really cool open source project. We've seen open source Geiger counters um, mm. after the Fukushima disaster with crowdsourced information uploaded to the web showing radiation counts around the area. We've seen a lot of uh, commercial projects in like industrial control and automation, um, smart web-based irrigation systems. I mean, it covers the gamut. I could touch 30 different industries. Right. So now there's your, Colin, you're here representing the .NET Gadgeteer that's based on the micro framework platform. Yes, I'll hold up my little my little sign here. This is so uh, the .NET Gadgeteer is was actually built by Microsoft Research. Okay. And initially they they did it because they do lots of gadgets and it takes too long to do it. So they thought, okay, we we could get put together a toolkit so that we can just grab a camera, grab a hook button, grab some things, plug them all together, and get it done really quickly. And uh, once they started doing that and saw how excited people got at it about it, they uh, started working on commercializing it. So we've been working with a number of external companies uh, that, so that we can bring out a whole ecosystem of boards and modules for people who don't want, either don't want to take the time to do the soldering or don't want to have to learn how to do how, what an I squared C interface mm -hmm. is. Uh, you can just take a, a module, look at the back of it, it tells you it plugs into this kind of socket. You look at the main board, it has that kind of socket, you plug it in, you're done. And what kind of things can people build with Gadgeteer? Essentially anything. Uh, I saw something that looked like a game console. We, we was well, yes, it, just for the demos. A here. little tabletop arcade. Yeah, they made a little so. arcade machine about this big, running Snake. Yep. Uh, there was another thing. And if you're here at Ozcon, you can just walk over to the booth and, and see and try. play the game. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, I'm actually teaching a high school class in the fall using it, and we're actually going to have the kids building digital cameras. Really? And wow. this is an introductory CS class. Wow, wow. Um, and so you can build, can you build robots with it? Sure. Yeah, okay. there's actually uh, robotic kits are, are on the list to come out early. Wow, that's great. And um, 
I understand that Gadgeteer is also going to make an appearance at Maker Faire Detroit, which is this this weekend, in fact. Yes, we're, we're having kind of a soft launch, and so yep. it's, it's not clear whether or not we're launching here or at Detroit, so we're kind Maybe of... Maybe you're e launching at both places. We're easing into Detroit. <laughs> okay, and so uh, so any folks who are in Detroit or going to Maker Faire Detroit this weekend can just check out the Gadgeteer booth to see some more, some more cool stuff. Yep. Uh, some of the folks who are here will actually be, I guess, hopping on a plane. Midnight plane on Thursday. Midnight <laughs> plane on Thursday, so go easy on them, folks. Uh, see, so you, you don't want to get them too tired. So, and uh, and so what, what's next for all this? What's next for Gadgeteer? And then we'll ask what's next for Netduino after, after that. Uh, well, what's next for Gadgeteer again is, is, is continuing to build the ecosystem, mm -hmm. uh, getting it out there, getting uh, making improvements on it. It's, it's also open source, by the way. It's, so all of the stack that's built on top of the micro framework, the hardware designs that, that go into it. So we're encouraging a, a broad ecosystem. We're, we're trying to build the same sort of community that we built around the micro framework so that people can trade ideas, trade experiences, make suggestions, even contribute to the product. So we're going to migrate the Gadgeteer in that same direction. Great. And Chris Walker, what's next for Netduino? See, you know you can't ask that question. The, the name of the, what, <laughs> tell me the name of the company that makes Netduino, so, Chris. So we're, we're Secret Labs. Right. Uh, you know, we, we design a lot of products for, for different companies and, and for ourselves, but we're big believers that we like delighting people when we ship stuff, and we spend a lot of time and a lot of engineering making things perfect, and then we release it. Um, we typically don't talk about things for release. What I will say is that the Micro Framework version 4.2 update's coming out later this summer. Um, we have some new capabilities in that that the community, as well as PL Secret Labs and PL Microsoft have added uh, to the main micro framework and also to our extensions um, that take advantage of some of the hardware on Netduino. And I will say here that we are currently working on three new Netduino boards. Wow, um, a I first. can't, yeah, I can't. Two of them are for next year. One of them will ship when it's ready. When um, it's ready. Yeah, we, we're, we're very big on quality. Everything from the process we use to manufacture these here in the United States um, and the people we employ to do that all the way through to the way the electrical design now, happens. Now tell me about your U.S. manufacturing. Yeah, so this is, you know, and I know there's been a lot of talk, especially this week here in America with, you know, the debt ceiling and interest rates and American jobs and everything else. We're big believers in domestic manufacturing, whatever country you're from. And so all the Netduinos, all the Netduino Pluses, and we've done this since uh, late last year, are actually made here in the United States. And that, so that's kind of a personal thing for us, but it's something that we think brings a lot of value to the equation of open source hardware. And before that, you were making it overseas. In China, yeah. But you were actually making some things here, such as the, the blue headers. I don't know, are, are, yeah. can we get close enough to see these blue headers here <laughs> are made made in the United States and you ship them overseas so, or you put them on here in the U.S.? We have multiple sources for different parts. Um, everything that we build in Netduino's Netduino Pluses as well as all of our new boards are assembled here in the United States. Um, all of your microcontrollers, in fact, we don't say made in USA, we say assembled in USA of on course. here. Because even though Parts the microcontrollers, like the silicon comes from, let's say, Colorado, but at some point it ends up in the Philippines and in, and in Asia, and legally we can't say something is made in America unless everything was done here. But we're trying to bring as much of this back here as we can. Um, we're trying to leave the... Um, you know, short-term molds and stuff like that that can only cost-effectively be done in China there, but all the long-term jobs and the engineering, we're really trying now, to bring back I to America. Now I understand. Or wherever you are in the world. What, one, one of the things I know about Netduino is that there's really no place you can go to buy these blue headers. <laughs> and, and, and Chris, tell us, Tell us why you can't buy these blue headers and, and how you, you came to have them. Well, so, uh, and again, you know, Netduino, this Netduino is probably about $35 in parts, yet we sell it for $35. The Netduino Plus is $60 in parts, yet we sell it for $60. I think he's making that up. No, uh, you, can, you can go and download the open source okay. design files and actually pull in all the parts. Um, we wanted to make sure that this was really affordable for people to get into, but that they also had drop-in parts so they could make their own. So the headers are based off of exact headers you can buy from DigiKey or Arrow or any of the major suppliers, but we simply have them custom made with a blue color because we want branding on the products. So whenever you see a, a Netduino product that's the black solder mask and the gold plating and the blue headers that you go, I know that's a quality product. I know it lives to the 100% open source standard that Secret Labs now, has. Now, uh, people watching this, some of them might have broken out the calculators on their cell phones. So just tell us how you can stay in business by selling a product. Uh, is Volume. It, is it that it would cost <laughs> anybody else 
thirty-five dollars. We we make a lot of products, so we get we get some significant volume discounts. Volume, but honestly, volume, volume. It, it is, but at the same time, Netduino is not a project that we started to get rich. Uh, I was telling someone earlier, half jokingly but half seriously, we were making eighty-nine cents per thirty-five dollar Netduino for the first couple months we were making these. Wow! And that was purely because we want to enable people to use these. Now we're making more than that, but it's literally just about enough so that we can continue for four or five years reinvesting in the platform and providing new open source designs and driving it forward. The people who we want to be successful are the people who are using this at home, in schools, bringing up the electrical and software engineering uh, curriculums across the world, right. but also people in the commercial sector who are building their own commercial designs. Right. We're, we're, we're trying to move one generation forward with the technology. So, maybe, maybe in wrapping up, where... I, I know you're launching now, but if somebody wants to get this Gadgeteer, uh, wh where would they go? Um, is there a Gadgeteer website where they can learn more or will learn more in the future? Yeah, so what we've done is we've made a, uh, a, a route off of the .NET website, a mi not microframework website. So if you go to netmf.com slash Gadgeteer uh, in about an hour. An hour. <laughs> no earlier. Uh, one hour, folks. <laughs> one hour. You'll be able to see uh, see that 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 site is actually uh, evolving as we launch. As this well. is exciting. This is a very soft launch of our website. As this well. is exciting. <laughs> We're giving some folks a preview. This yeah. is great. So, and if people want to get a Netduino. Yeah, so well, you can go to makershed.com. There's lots of different resellers. And on the Gadgeteer front, we're actually looking at adding Gadgeteer capabilities as well. So eventually you'll have kind of one happy world where all these things give you lots of capabilities. Now, now in closing, uh, Chris and I have a working relationship, uh, that of um, editor, and uh, I'm the editor and he's the sufferer. I mean, the, the author. And uh, you're actually writing a, getting, a book called Getting Started with Netduino. That is true. And that book's in progress. Yep, and maybe yeah, this fall. Coming out this fall, and maybe we, we're going to try to have some preview chapters up. Uh, you'll be able to read about the book on O'Reilly.com. Yeah, Get absolutely. started with Netduino, and we'll have sample chapters up on Netduino.com whenever that's possible. And this hopefully. is your way of pressuring him to get that done. Yeah. <laughs> and I understand you're going to have half the book written uh, by this evening. Oh, like by this morning. <laughs> All right, that's great. Colin Miller, Chris Walker, thank you so much. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a lot of fun. Enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you, and Brian. Have a blast.